Welcome to CITV Today. I'm Lisa Pickering. We're here at the Artemis Racing Base. I'm with Emma Etteridge and Bo Etteridge to speak about the recently released documentary called Sailing for a School Bus. Welcome. Thank you. Now, before we get started, you had just mentioned, Emma, that the America's Cup Committee and the Bermuda Committee, uh, community was highly involved in, in getting the school bus to Uganda. They were. It was an incredible opportunity, I think, being here in Bermuda and having such an amazing community of America's Cup sailors here and also a very passionate local community. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting a lady called Rebecca Roberts who was working for Renaissance Re and I'd been explaining that the school that I support in Uganda desperately needed a school bus but that it cost $30,000 so it was just too hard a, a dream to make come true. And Rebecca just looked at me and laughed and said, this is Bermuda, anything's possible, we can make that happen. So I reached out to my friends in the America's Cup community that were here in the time from Artemis, from Oracle and also from SoftBank Team Japan and said, is there any chance you guys would mind to help us out with this fundraiser? And within two hours, they were all on board and we went from there. Now you started volunteering in 2009 at CASO in Uganda. What inspired you to begin that journey? I had grown up as a, what we call a cup kid, i.e. an America's Cup kid. I'd spent my whole childhood traveling the world. Um, I thought it was normal as a kid to bounce around the world to all different places following this elusive dream of, of winning the America's Cup. And I think along the way I met a lot of people and a lot of different cultures around the world and realized I was incredibly lucky to have been born in New Zealand to a family of people that love me and could afford to clothe, educate and house me. And I realized unfortunately in a lot of parts of the world that actually wasn't the case. And so I just became fixated on this idea of life as an accident of birth that you know you don't do anything to choose where you're born and what family you're born into. And so at the age of 25, with a rather idealistic dream of trying to save the world, I headed off to Uganda, having no idea that my six months in this little village would become a lifelong journey and one that I would just you know, continue for the rest of my life. I just fell in love with all the people there and not only what they were doing in the school, but how they were doing it in such a genuine way that I believed in so much. And there was, there's so much trust still to this day now between me and between Dominic and Rose, the couple that started the school, that I know that whatever money I send to them or whatever project we try and do, the money's going to the right place and it's in safe hands, which is a huge thing in this world that you can actually be accountable and vouch for the project that you're supporting. Now you've raised about $60,000 locally here in Bermuda. I believe some of it went to a water harvesting project as well. Can you exactly. dive in a little bit about that? Sure. <laughs> Rebecca and I often laugh that only in Bermuda could you set out to raise $30,000 for a school bus and accidentally raise $40,000, <laughs> which was what we did here. So the, the school bus got all the, all the trims and extras and now we have some of that money left in a fund to help maintain the school bus and to help to, to keep it on the roads. As you can imagine, the roads in Uganda aren't always the friendliest for, um, for a bus. And so after that, sort of riding on the success of that, so many people came on board and especially thanks to Bo's amazing documentary, Sailing for a School Bus, said, well, this sounds like such an incredible project. How can we get involved? And so I put my head together again with Rebecca and we partnered with the Hamilton Rotary Club here in Bermuda to do a water harvesting project. It seemed incredibly appropriate that obviously Bermuda has this unique water harvesting system that every single house collects its own water, it all goes into a tank under the house and that's what you live on. In Uganda, unfortunately at the school at Kaso, there was guttering on less than a third of the buildings within the school. So in the twice um, yearly rainy season, all the water would just wash straight off the roof and onto the ground and be wasted. And I have photos of the kids holding their little plastic bowls and cups trying to catch the drops of water off the, the edge of the tin roof and it was just so heartbreaking and so I showed those to some people here and they very quickly responded. So we launched this water harvesting fundraiser and now we've got the money to put guttering on every single building at the school and to build 200,000 litre water tanks to catch all that water oh, wow. and put taps on the bottom so that the kids can just get fresh water. Did you think you'd accomplish so much um, on your visit to Bermuda? I, I really didn't. I mean, obviously we came here for the America's Cup, but I think um, I was in a bit of a, an unusual situation that I'd always worked on the Cup my whole life. And then after I um, got together with my now husband, Nathan, who's um, sales here with Artemis, I wasn't really able to work anymore. We were on the road. His schedule was insane between the Olympic campaign and the America's Cup campaign. And all of a sudden it came a, became a conflict of interest for me 
to be working in my old job in the America's Cup, which I struggled with at the beginning, but very quickly worked out that, well, now I had this amazing opportunity to invest all of my time and effort and energy into my project in Uganda, which is exactly what I did. And I think, you know, traveling the world with this amazing bunch of people in the America's Cup community, they're a very outward looking worldly bunch who are very aware that their life is, is quite different and is pretty special and I think a lot of people are aware of the privilege that comes with that and really desperately want to help other people around the world but most importantly they want to be able to help them in a genuine way where as I say they know that the money is going to the right places and so people have often thanked me for giving them the opportunity to donate in a meaningful way in a way in which they know it's actually genuine. A bow over to you, I don't want to leave you out. Um, the documentary you produced, filmed and edited um, and directed, everything, many hats, many hats. Um, Had a bit of help with this <laughs> one. Well, you're obviously related brother and sister-in-law, um, but what inspired you to get involved in this project? Because you primarily shoot for sport, don't you, do you not? Yeah, I mean, basically my whole job is to film and photograph sailing at all different events around the world. So yeah, like Emma was saying, we live this crazy world where we don't, it's not a normal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And you, you get to see a lot more things in the world and see people in all different places. But one of the big things was when I like first met Emma, she told me all about the, her experiences there, but not only that, tasked me with jobs of film, editing some video <laughs> and photos. She had already, uh, you were already shot there. And you know, when you're, when you're given all this raw content and you see what it is for what it is, like you end up going, man, it would be pretty, pretty cool to be a part of that and really help these people a lot more. So um, back in 2014, well, at the end of 2013, I met, I talked with Emma about going there. And so a year later, we thought about going, I planned, booked my flights. And um, there was this huge Ebola outbreak and everyone was a bit worried about us going. So I ended up changing plans and was it two years later, ended up going with Emma. So that was like mind blowing, like to see it firsthand, to see all the, all the projects that are happening and especially with the help of Emma, like uh, the, all those projects at the school, it was pretty cool. So what was your experience like with this documentary then? How did it change your perspective on what you can do through the world of media? Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely knew there was a, it was a, it was a very, uh, what's the word? It was, you know, it's it pretty important to capture all the, uh, the effort and the money and the generosity that people in Bermuda and the America's Cup community contributed. Because, you know, like, if you show them exactly where it's going and how grateful the people are at the school, you end up, you know, showing them that what you did was really worthwhile and maybe more people will continue giving, maybe it can help them even more than before. So that's kind of why I wanted to help out. But, you know, personally, going somewhere like that really gives you a lot more perspective on the world and wants you, it makes you want to help a lot more too. So any future projects that you have that you kind of are thinking about in terms of that vein? I mean, we're definitely, ugh, I'm definitely going back. So we <laughs> still have to, yeah, I think Emma and Nathan are having a, a Uganda wedding because I don't think it's an official wedding or marriage until you've had it there. <laughs> That's what the people say. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty keen to, to go back again with Emma and I, as soon as like, this project was pretty huge undertaking the editing process of it in general, like, but I could talk about that a bit more of it. This is more of like, I'd love to go back and cover more projects with Emma and also get involved with m more things that are happening, whether it's in Africa or in, other places in the world. Now it aired at the Bermuda Film Festival I believe. Uh, what was the response like? Um, well I unfortunately couldn't make it to the film festival but Emma was there and I think we had a bit of a fan club there that was watching the film. We did, no it was incredible. It was very much my first film festival. I was laughing to Bo, calling him from across the world saying I never ever imagined in my whole life that we'd be at a film festival and I think that's that's one of the most incredible things about a place like Bermuda. You arrive, you meet people and instantly things happen and suddenly we find ourselves in the Bermuda International Film Festival and it was um, with huge thanks to, um, to Neil Glass and Kim Carter who had helped get behind this whole project and were really, really pushing it and the deadline had actually 
expired to enter the film festival and Neil and Kim said no 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 that that's that's not not going to happen and put us in touch with Nikki who helped us get the film in last minute and we were so so grateful for that but it was it was amazing it was incredible to actually see the film up on the big screen we'd actually done a a sneak sort of preview premiere um, at Masterworks Gallery and had invited all of the people that had donated so that they could see firsthand what their money had actually helped to achieve, which was wonderful. And then it was just amazing, as I say, seeing it properly on the big screen in the film festival. And we had a Q&A after and there were so many people that were really interested in, um, in finding out more. And I think for me, my, my biggest hope is just that through all of this we can spread the word about Caso and about the amazing work being done there so that one day other people might be able to support they might be able to go visit or even if they're not going to go all the way to, T to Uganda that they just become more aware of projects like this around the world. Well the school bus after watching the documentary the school bus was more of a symbol than anything in terms of development and also possibility I think someone said that in the film it shows the possibility of what we can do. Exactly, there's an incredible um, scene that Bo just happened to capture that evening after all the sort of madness had died down of the initial um, chaos of us arriving and amongst everyone in the community when we came back to the volunteer house and teacher Sarah, who's one of the most unbelievable um, women I've ever met, she's one of the founding teachers of the school, and she just happened to be talking to me and Bo being the one he is, came out with his camera and captured it. But she was explaining in such a heartfelt way that when the school started in 1999, Dominic and Rose had nothing. They, they had five children of their own, but they had no money. They had very, very few resources. And they decided to start a free school for AIDS orphans to help them have an opportunity. And everybody laughed and said, who are these people? What do they think they're doing? Of course, this is going to fail. There's no chance this can ever work. And by the end of the first year, those 12 children had turned into 49 children. And every year it's just grown and grown. And now there are 638 children. And I think what teacher Sarah was explaining was that for those people that once doubted what was possible, now seeing that not only has the school grown to such an extent, but they actually have a school bus, which was something that no one in the whole district has, the people had finally realized that when Dominic and Rose say they'll do something, it happens. And as teacher Sarah said, it makes you realize anything is possible. So two years from now, it will be the 20th anniversary of the school opening. You will have been with them for 10 years. What would you like to see happen in that time? Oh, wow. There's, um, I mean, it's incredible. There's already so much that has happened. One of my favorite photos, actually, I think Dominic um, shows a picture of it in the film, is the original grass thatched hut that the school started in in 1999 and I mean you look around now and and it's funny I do have to laugh sometimes it, it Caso is a, a private school but it's not a private school as um as perhaps you would find here in Bermuda or, or back in New Zealand but it's just incredible with so few resources but such huge de tenacity and determination what they've achieved and I think the, the biggest thing for me that I hope I know for a fact that Caso will keep on growing and developing what but what I would love to see is other schools and other communities in the area using that as a bit of an example and a model and taking their lead from that and helping to grow this incredible um, community that Caso, because I mean the Caso is, is in a small village but the whole community around it has really grown outwards from the school so I hope that that's something that can be replicated in other parts of Uganda and, and all of Africa. Let's talk a little bit about uh, corporate responsibility. Um, how important is that and you're kind of in the corporate world and you used your talents obviously for this documentary um, but how, how much do you rely on corporate um, individuals? Actually not a lot. Um, pre, you know, Until the Sailing for a School Bus fundraiser with Ren Ree, all of our donations really had come from individuals. I, um, I mean I'm just one person, we're not a huge organization, we're not even a registered charity, it really is just me and my passion and, and speaking to people around me. I love to write. I've actually written a book about my experiences in Uganda that I'm working on trying to get published at the moment. And I think from day one when I first went, that was what I did, is I would just write these huge group emails to everyone I knew to try and drum up support because it was sort of the only way I knew how. And then I would receive emails from friends of friends of friends saying that they'd been following my journey and could I add them to the list. And so I think that was one of the things I loved that the very first big fundraiser we did was a, a dormitory that sleeps 100 girls, which is called Kiwi House, which is still very much a, a part of Caso. 
And that was literally just from donations of anywhere between $30 and $1,000 from friends, family, friends of friends, friends of family, and just people all coming together and pitching in in a small but very meaningful way. And so I think, you know, it, it, I've always tried as much as possible and having just raised $60,000, it's obviously not small, but you know, I, I think to me the beauty is still of keeping it small, keeping it manageable and keeping it very, very personal. And that's not to say that we don't have huge dreams and huge visions for all that we can do, but I wanna make sure that for all of us involved, we can still very firmly keep our feet on the ground and not get so carried away that you actually lose sight of what it is. So Bill, back to you, um, just what was the one takeaway that you, you had from this whole experience and from making the documentary when you tell people about this experience? <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, uh, well, I think you, if you go there, you see a lot more of what is actually going on. You know, I mean, before I went there, I didn't know. I mean, I, I'd seen videos and I still didn't really know how it was happening there, how things were happening. And, Day, well, I arrived there and there's like a thousand people cheering and screaming and the bus arrived and I'm running around with cameras not knowing anybody. That was pretty intense. So I'll always remember that, no, no <laughs> doubt. I mean, basically we, we show up to the, the, main, the dirt road off the main road to, to drive an extra 30 minutes, 20 minutes to get to the school. And here's the school truck, which is what they used to get all the kids around in. And that became illegal. So there was the necessity for a school bus. So we like, I jumped on board that to film the school bus from the front and so there, there was all these things that I remember but I know if anyone shows up they won't remember those things because that's not normal <laughs> but for me I mean I rem yeah I think I think the biggest takeaway is that if you you can always be doing good things from afar and that's all well and good and I think that's hugely appreciated but if you go there you really see everything happening and you really see how grateful they are you don't you don't get that from here you don't I mean, until someone like me and Emma can come back with photos and video to show people, you really don't actually appreciate their gratitude because it's, it's huge. That's the biggest thing. And last question for you, Emma. You said in the documentary that you didn't think that you could raise the funds for the school bus originally. So now, has that inspired you to dream bigger? And if so, what's your next big goal? <laughs> it's funny you should ask that, actually. <clears throat> I just spoke to Dominic yesterday. Um, called him in Uganda to share the good news that we had officially raised all of the money for the water harvesting fundraiser. And as he did with the bus, he screamed and cheered and yupped and hollered and he was so, so, so excited and so grateful. He sent me a beautiful message after reiterating his thanks to me, to Nathan, to Rebecca and to the People's Republic of Bermuda. <laughs> <laughs> which I just loved, he's, he's such a character. <laughs> and so I said to him, now Dominic, you know, what's next? I've got all these people that are actually very excited about also helping and contributing and hopefully through all the work we continue to do, we can keep raising awareness. And the school has an ongoing priorities list. So every year when I go out, we update the priorities list. But since I've been in Bermuda, we seem to be getting through different projects at a rate of knots and so Dominic said, please, can you just give me a day or two to speak to my wife Rose to, you know, to brainstorm to see what the next projects are. Um, there are still a lot of things. A, a big one is, is to build another um, classroom block and dormitory. The children are currently sleeping in triple-decker bunks, which is illegal. There's one dormitory that has double-decker bunks, and so we're trying to reduce them so that the children can have a little bit more space, so that it's more hygienic, safer, and just a, a nicer environment. And we're also talking about planting a eucalyptus forest, which is an income generating project for the school. Eucalyptus grows incredibly well in Uganda. And um, the school has about nine different gardens all around the surrounding area that they use to help supplement because a lot of the children still can't afford to pay any school fees. And so they have so many innovative projects like that. I think one of the, the most amazing things, one of my biggest takeaways from my time in Uganda is, as Rose always says, because I often become, I'm a very emotional person and often become overwhelmed by all there is to do and by how great the need is. And Rose would always just sit me down and explain that, Madame Emma, we cannot do everything, but we can do something. And I think it's what I always try and keep in mind is it's so easy to feel overwhelmed. And I feel in general people, can, can feel a little bit overwhelmed by how much there is to do and so therefore they end up just doing nothing. 
Whereas I, I always have Rose's words in my head saying, well, even if it's one small thing, one small thing can be a really big thing for someone else, or one small thing can lead to many great things. That's a really good point. And if people want to contact you and help, um, how do they go about that? We now have a, a website, um, well, an updated website, um, which is www.caso-uganda.org, where there's all the information about the school there, and they can contact me via the website there, and I would be more than happy to talk with them further. Perfect. Well, best of luck with all your future projects. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on CITV today, right here at the Artemis Racing Base. I'm Lisa Pickering. Mm -hmm.